This is QTV News. I am Maria Tusidibe and thanks for joining us. First, the main local, international and sports news headlines. Gambia's Ministry of Health today confirmed the highest one-day total of positive corona cases. Six out of the 14 are health care workers. The Gambia Action Party's presidential candidate for the 2021 elections have been expelled from the party following a widely shared nude video on social media said to be of him. The Public Service Pensions Bill 2020 tabled by the Vice President was read for a second time by lawmakers at the National Assembly. An unidentified witness on Thursday told the TRRC about the horrible experience she and her child went through during the former president's so-called HIV treatment program. In international news, the International Criminal Court on Wednesday broke new ground when it opened the trial of a Malian jihadist charged with gross human rights violations against women and girls. And U.S. President Donald Trump has signed an order to put an end to preferential economic treatment for Hong Kong after China enacted a new security law. In sports, the Bacau Sports Committee has announced the postponement of this year's community football tournament, traditionally called Nawetan. Those were the main headlines and now the news in detail. In local news, the Ministry of Health today confirmed 14 new positive cases of coronavirus, the highest single-day rise in the country. This brings to 78 the total number of confirmed cases in the Gambia. Mr. Lamin Bojang has been expelled from the Gambia Action Party following a video said to be of a nude Mr. Bojang, which was widely shared on social media. Until his sacking on Tuesday, he was the party's presidential candidate for the 2021 presidential elections. More in this exclusive report by QTV's Ansumana Esonyase. I am completely innocent. I am completely innocent. The man is not inconsistent. He's, he say A today, tomorrow is B. Now we start realizing a leader don't say A and tomorrow is say B. A scandal at the wrong time and perhaps for the wrong party, given how much the party's leadership has had to deal with since its inception in January last year. The party's Secretary General, Musayali Bachili, has been engulfed in allegations of fraud and legal battles over his dealings with individuals and business partners. But as the country and political parties prepare for the presidential elections next year, GAP is once again in the headlines for all the wrong reasons, and this time for an even more serious scandal. The party's presidential candidate, Lamin Bojang, has been sacked and expelled from the party, following the circulation online last week of a video allegedly showing him in the nude, thus becoming the first political party leader in Gambia's recent history to be married in such a disaster. Until his expulsion, Bojang's gap image was that of a man with a distinguished record in the public service. A former nurse and army general under ex-president Jami, Bojang also served under the current government as Gambia's deputy chief of mission in Russia. But in the wake of this leaked video, amidst family pressure and threats of expulsion from his party, he finally broke his silence at a press conference on Tuesday. Trying very hard not to cry, the former general sobbed repeatedly, insisting on his innocence. I have been lured in into politics through members of Gambia Action Party with the desire for us to join together and move this country forward through politics. I have never committed any criminal activities. I'm not a criminal. Not even... Not even during this moment. I am completely innocent. I am completely innocent. I am completely innocent. However, his once close ally, now a distant friend, the party's Secretary General, Musayali Bachili, says the former diplomat has been expelled for accusing the executive of circulating his nude video and for convening a press conference without consulting the party executive, an allegation that Bojang strongly disputes. I'm giving him ultimatum now. If you believe you are not, 
you are not in that video, call doctors. Out of secret, they sign. Let them screen you and compare with that video where they see you're not. If it's not you, I will resign from this position and say, come, you lead us in all kind of form and we'll support you. Don't talk. Don't talk. With his political career now at stake, Bojang insists his current predicament is a setup by party insiders. Contacted for comment on his sacking from the party, he told QTV that he will respond to Bachili's allegations later. He says the party has not formally conveyed its decision to expel him, an allegation that Mr. Bachili refuted, claiming he was served with a letter of expulsion, but that Bojang refused to accept the letter, asking the executive to give him 48 hours to prove his innocence. I'm urging him to respect himself. Don't blame nobody. Blame yourself. Me, if it was Bachili, I would call doctors now. They look at my private part. They look whatever is shown in my body. Compared to the video, if it's me, I resign. The decision to abandon the former army general Bojang, who dissociates himself from the video content, which we are not in a position to sow, means that Gap now has to fill the gap at the top of the party, which has been created by this scandal. And so is Nyasi for KTV News. The Public Service Pensions Bill 2020, tabled by the Vice President, was read for a second time on Wednesday by lawmakers. Deputies debated the merits and principles of the bill before it was referred to the Assembly Business Committee for further referral either to the Committee of the Whole House or a Select Committee. The Public Service Pension Bill 2020 was tabled for second reading on 6th July. However, the debate was suspended and deferred pending the submission of the general merits and principles of the bill. The bill seeks to repeal the 1950 Pension Act and introduce a contributory pension scheme as opposed to the current non contributed scheme. VP2 says the bill seeks to achieve the cardinal principles of a highly motivated and performing civil service. According to her, the government acknowledges the need for a decent pay for serving civil servants and retirees. This, she believes, will be a motivating factor to maintain public servants. The bill seeks to introduce a new procedure for the management, administration, and processing of retirement benefits to ensure not only the improvement of pension entitlements, but also the efficiency of the process of pension payment. In debating the merits, members welcome the new bill and hope the purpose will be achieved. Just a process of remedying an injustice which now exists, where people pay, and at the end of the day, they find it difficult to receive what they have put in national coffers. Uh, for far too long, our very industrious workers have been wallowing in abject poverty, if you like, controlled suffering after long years of hard work. There are cases of uh, pensioners who would leave their pension in the treasury for almost a year to be able to buy a bag of rice. <clears throat> I know one case where a pensioner receives only 80 dollars per month for his, for his pension. Things that need to be looked at, we live in a digitalized world the recording systems have to be correct. If that is not done, we'll still continue to have the problems that people do encounter when they retire from their job places after serving for so many years. Once passed, it is expected to provide a decent and timely pay for retirees. The bill also seeks to raise the legal age for retirement from 55 to 60. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alu Sise. Continuing investigations on the former president's so-called HIV treatment program, an unidentified witness on Thursday told the TRRC that she was abandoned by her family and husband and ended up a street beggar after being infected with the HIV virus through a blood transfusion following an accident. Babu Karsi reports. The witness, who was allowed to testify anonymously, said she became HIV positive in 2004 when she was admitted at the then RVTH for one year and nine months following an accident when she was just two months pregnant. At the hospital, the witness said she needed four pins of blood before she could be operated open. 
ibuke yelo jibe o taimu ka jibe fo nyin yelo be min ta kan tempo ka di mol la fay sa sa soto fama sa sa soto then uh, i had information from people that in those days people who donate blood were not checked or tested to see if they had the virus or not. They just donate blood and they just take that for granted and give that blood to other people without testing the blood to see if it is infected or not. The witness said she and her child resorted to taking antiretroviral medication which she got from the Brigham Health Center. She acknowledged that the medication helped improve their immune systems. She later joined an association called Alaten to support society an association in which include HIV infected children was formed by HIV positive parents to offer support and counseling to each other and of which she later became the president. On the issue of the former president's HIV treatment program, the witness said she joined the program in 2007 after registering at the Sarakunda General Hospital. After that, she and others were then put in a bus bound for State House where they went through a horrible experience. If you reach inside in the inner room, you will have to take off your clothes and tie that towel. Because they'll tell you to take off all your clothes, even a string will not remain on your body. The anonymous witness told the TRRC that she drank the concoction called chakri. She later suffered from running stomach and vomiting. As a result of the medication Express then Jame gave them, she said her child's health deteriorated and Jame then ordered for the child to be taken to the RVTH. After spending two and a half months at Jame's treatment center, she was sent home when Jame discovered that she was in contact with a British national who was also a member of the Alatentu Society. She confessed that many HIV patients taking treatment under Jame died during and after treatment. But some felt very sick in my presence there, but I left them like that. They didn't die in my presence. Well, even after their treatment, a lot of them also died. While making her concluding remarks, the witness said she has suffered a lot because her family, including her husband, abandoned her without any choice and no source of income and support. She ended up as a street beggar to feed her family. She begged the commission to offer support to her only child as the child's father has refused to accept him because he is HIV positive. Babu Karsi, QTV News. We will go for a short commercial break. The news continues when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The National Assembly Standing Committee on Defense and Security has sought Parliament's approval for a parliamentary hearing on the saga between Semlex and Pristine Consulting over the biometric national ID cards production. As Alusisi reports, the request was contained in the committee's fact-finding report on issue. On 22nd September 2018, the Gambia government announced the resumption of the production of the national identity documents by the Semlex Group. Two claims were associated with the resumption of the production of the national documents. The first alluded to the renegotiation of a contract. The other alluded to the restoration of contract. Gambia company Princeton Consulting, that claimed to be a legitimate contractor, alleged that the government irregularly awarded Semlex the contract. Subsequently, the National Assembly, during its second ordinary session in 2018, asked the Standing Committee on Defense and Security to investigate the controversy to establish the facts. In laying the report on Tuesday, Halifa Salah, the member for Sarakunda and vice chairperson of the committee, says the Justice Ministry claimed that a contract to produce biometric ID cards with Semlex was signed on 16 June 2016 for a duration of five years. However, it was allegedly terminated on 24 August 2016 through an executive directive without proper legal procedure and against the legal advice of the Justice Ministry. 
President Ball's government had the option to maintain the contract or disregard it, but this could have led to international arbitration and possible sanctions. As a result, according to the committee's findings, the government considered it more prudent to renegotiate. And a renegotiated contract was signed with Semlex on 19 July 2018 to formalize the restoration of the contract. The negotiated contract provided for the sharing of the total revenue generated from the project on a ratio entirely telling the Gambia government 40% of the sum and some like 60% uh, respectively. In contrast to the 30%, 60% uh, equation in favor of Semlex as per the original terms of the contract. That the concerns raised over Semlex's reputation in other parts of Africa has been acknowledged and ongoing investigations into their affairs by the Belgian authorities is being monitored. On the issue of Christine Consulting, documents provided by the Interior Ministry confirmed that a contract to produce biometric ID cards was signed on 20 April 2009 with Pristine Consulting for five years from that date. Another contract was signed with the Pristine Consulting on 4 May 2015, but this time to produce electronic birth registration system and certificates with the Ministry of Health, and that the Minister of Interior witnessed the signing of the contract but was a signatory. Signing of the contract to produce electronic birth registration system and certificates was considered by Preston Consulting as a renewal or extension of the master agreement of 2009, but that the ministries of Interior and Justice argued that the said agreement cannot infer an extension as there was no opinion to determine or connect the two contracts and no document to suggest that this agreement was endorsed by the Minister of Interior. That the negotiations to award a new contract in 2016 started after the expiration of the Gambis project with pristine consulting. That there was no basis of the Gambia government being held accountable for breach of contract by pristine consulting. The committee is now seeking Parliament's approval to undertake a robust hearing into the Semlex and Pristine Consulting contracts and their related matters to clarify the issues raised and get the truth from the concerned ministries, their permanent secretaries, the Semlex and Pristine Consulting managers and councils respectively. This, the committee believes, will help to review the existing laws, regulations and contractual procedures associated with public-private partnerships. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sise. The World Food Program on Tuesday presented a vehicle to the Gambia Red Cross Society to ease mobility challenges for the organization when responding to disasters. Lamin Dabo tells us more. The donation came as a result of the existing partnership between Gambia Red Cross Society and the WFP, which has been manifested in a series of humanitarian activities. At the handing over ceremony, the Secretary General of the Gambia Red Cross Society, Alassane Senghor, says the donated vehicle will go in a long way towards promoting effective service delivery for the institution. WFP came in partnership with the Red Cross to do that fumigation with a record time. I think it was less than one week it was done. The whole 500 and something schools were done, were fumigated by the Red Cross volunteers with the support of the WFP. And that is only one part of our partnership. We've been doing distribution of supplementary feeding uh, food items to people in the communities over the years. We have plans now, we're working on nutrition, we're working on resilience, and we are working on other things that are obviously humanitarian but also development in nature. The World Food Program country representative Wanja Karia explains what motivates her institution to donate the vehicle to the Red Cross. The WFP goal has been to support and strengthen the capacity of the government and the people of the Gambia in addressing development challenges including resilience building, food, food insecurity, malnutrition and the coordination and implementation of disaster risk reduction and management. With this mandate, WFP is pleased to have a partner with whom we can rely, whose mandate is similar, allowing us to concert efforts 
with yet another equally committed partner, the Gambia Red Cross Society. Our partnership has grown in leaps and bounds, and more so now, as the SG said, in the light of the COVID pandemic. The president of the Gambia Red Cross Society, Jato Silla, used the occasion to call on people to adhere to the precautionary measures to prevent the spread of the COVID-19. This vehicle is one of the uh, appreciation as a token for to facilitate the movement of Gambia Red Cross because they have realized that we are spread throughout the country. We are everywhere to the last village. There is no village where you don't get a Red Cross volunteer. And there is no Red Cross volunteer that will tell you, no, I have to get my allowance before I do this. They willingly do what have, whatever they have to do for the sake of humanity. And that's why the whole Gambia should really appreciate the work of the Red Cross volunteers. And also, not only appreciate, but also support them. And, and so they are safe and so they are um, comfortable. In 2018, the Gambia Red Cross Society and the World Food Program signed a four-year memorandum of understanding to collaborate on humanitarian work. For QTV News, Lamin Alaj Fandin Dawo. The Global Youth Parliament Gambia chapter on Wednesday presented an honorary award to the Minister of Health, Dr. Ahmad Lamin Samate, in recognition of his role in exposing corruption in the health sector and his stance in the fight against the coronavirus. Omar Pijalo reports. The honorary award came following the minister's exposure during a parliamentary session of corruption practices, allegedly by some health workers in relation to COVID-19 funds. There were names of over 300 volunteers. Nobody knows where those volunteers are. That means they are not working in the health sector, so if they are volunteers, uh, that also went. We say, no, no start again. Remove all the volunteers. Bring the list of the core people. The list of the core people was brought. Some people came together to say, we know the people who are the active players. That list came. We saw names appearing in one section and another and another and another. Then I said, no, again. Two people back. Handing over the award, the National Coordinator of the Global Youth Parliament, GYP Gambia Chapter, Baba Sise, said GYP recognized the Air Force healthcare frontliners are making since the pandemic started. Receiving the award, Dr. Ahmed Lamin Samate said since the Gambia confirmed its first COVID-19 case, the Ministry of Health with its nurses and doctors continued to play a significant role in ensuring the safety and well-being of people. Dr. Samate said he has dedicated the award to the health workers and the Gambian people. I therefore accept this award on behalf of the entire health workers of this country. And I dedicate, I also dedicate this award to all the health workers of this country, all the security forces of this country, all the people who are participating in the COVID-19 struggle, who are always there day and night, standing by each other, standing by the people of this country. I say to them, this award is actually for you. The Assistant National Coordinator of the Association, Winifred Nicole, said the award is to inspire government officials and individuals from around the globe. The public relations officer of GYP, Omar Fai, 
said the award recognizes the roles Minister Samate continues to play as the health minister as the world grapples with the coronavirus pandemic. The Secretary General of the organization, Pamuru Cham, states that the GYP recognized the important role and sacrifice healthcare workers, especially the frontliners, have played and continue to play since the outbreak of the pandemic. Reporting for KTV News, I am Omar P. Jalo. And now to international news. The International Court on Wednesday broke new ground when it opened the trial of a Malian jihadist charged with torture, extrajudicial punishments and participation in a policy of forced marriage, which the court argues led to repeated rapes and sexual enslavement of women and girls. More in this report. In many previous ICC prosecutions, charges were mainly based on ethnic or religious grounds. Women's rights campaigners welcome this historic ICC prosecution of Al Hassan Ak Abdul Aziz at Mohammed Ak Mahmoud on the grounds of gender. According to a gender rights group based at The Hague, the Al Hassan case was groundbreaking, not just because of the use of the charge of persecution based on gender for the first time, but also because it included non sexual violence too. The prosecution has alleged in its charge sheet that Mr. Al Hassan had been a member of an extremist regime that hunted down women, tortured and detained them in inhumane conditions for no other reason than the fact that the women had worn headscarf considered too beautiful or that they had not worn gloves at the market. The 42-year-old Mr. Al Hassan was alleged to have committed these crimes during a six-month period in 2012 and 2013 when the Malian city of Timbuktu fell to Tuareg rebels and other Islamist militant factions, including a local group called Ansar Din, which, the prosecution alleges, Al-Hassan had joined shortly before the occupation of the city and led a force of religious police which enforced a harsh version of Sharia law in areas under their control. They banned music, forced women to wear the burqa, prevented girls from attending school and demolished Islamic saints' graves. Mr. Al-Hassan was captured by the French soldiers who had joined the Malian government forces to push back the extremist militants in 2013. He was surrendered to the ICC in 2018 and on 15 July this year, the trial began. Mr. Al-Hassan, according to media reports, remained impassive throughout the early part of the televised hearing and when asked to enter a plea, he refused, saying to the judges 13 times, I cannot answer that question. According to his defense lawyers, he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and was unfit to stand trial. They further argued that the full psychological assessment had not been conducted because of the COVID-19 restrictions. This is only the second trial of an Islamist militant at the ICC. In 2016, and other militants during the occupation of Timbuktu, Ahmad Al-Faki Al-Mahdi was found guilty by the ICC and sentenced to nine years in prison for his role in the destruction of world-famous religious shrines and monuments in Timbuktu. Some of the mosques they damaged were designated UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Al-Mahdi, at his trial, pleaded guilty, apologized and advised other Muslims against extremism which is still a huge problem in Mali. But a successful prosecution of Al-Hassan will not only boost the ICC, which has been under much criticism, but it will also reinforce the message that there is no hiding place for people who commit crimes against humanity. And the gender rights movement will have scored a significant victory in its crusade to attain respect and dignity for women. For QTV News, I am Mahmoud Mbouj. U.S. President Donald Trump has signed an order to put an end to preferential economic treatment for Hong Kong after China enacted a new security law. Loli M. Kamara has more. The law punishes Chinese officials whom the U.S. considers to be a responsibility for cracking down on Hong Kong and the move prompted Beijing to vow retaliatory sanctions. President Trump also signed an order ending the city's special status with the U.S., revoking preferential treatment on trade and travel. Today I signed legislation 
and an executive order to hold China accountable for its oppressive actions against the people of Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which I signed this afternoon, passed unanimously through Congress. This law gives my administration powerful new tools to hold responsible the individuals and the entities involved in extinguishing Hong Kong's freedom. We've all watched what happened. Not a good situation. Their freedom's been taken away. Their rights have been taken away. And with it goes Hong Kong, in my opinion, because it will no longer be able to compete with free markets. A lot of people will be leaving Hong Kong, I suspect. In a related development, the New York Times has announced that it will move part of its Hong Kong office to Seoul because of the treasury's new national security law. China has strongly criticized the move, ready to take retaliatory action. The U.S. sees the security law as a threat to the freedoms Hong Kong has enjoyed under a 1984 agreement. Reports shows that the special status was agreed between China and Hong Kong's former colonial power. The UK before sovereignty was returned to Beijing in 1997. President Trump added he has signed the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which passes unanimously in Congress earlier this month. This law gives his administration powerful new tools to hold responsible individuals and the entities involved in extinguishing Hong Kong's freedom. On the side of China, its foreign ministry condemned the latest U.S. moves, saying they were across interference in its domestic affairs. The move comes in the wake of a variety of sanctions and actions by the U.S. and its allies against China and Chinese-owned companies, including a much-talked-about trade war between the world's two biggest economies. The day before the announcement by the U.S., the U.K. government announced the ban on telecoms company buying Chinese company Huawei's 5G technology. A poll in Germany this week shows the majority question saying they expect China to overtake the U.S. as a superpower in the coming decades. Many analysts believe this is what lies at the root of sanctions against China. Loli M. Kamara reporting for QTV News. The United Kingdom has banned Huawei from its 5G telecom network, reversing a January decision to allow the embattled Chinese tech company a limited role in building the country's superfast wireless infrastructure. Mariama Fall reports. The UK's mobile providers are being banned from buying new Huawei 5G equipment after 31st December and they must also remove all the Chinese farm 5G kits from their networks by 2027. The decision is a huge blow for Huawei, which has operated in Britain for 20 years. Europe is a key market for the company, accounting 24% of sales last year. Huawei on Monday announced heavier results earlier than usual, reporting slower revenue growth. A U.S. campaign against Huawei was having mixed success until the imposition of new sanctions in May, which further reduced the company's ability to manufacture and obtain semiconductor chips using American-made technology. The company is already experiencing a decline in smartphone sales after Washington blocked it from accessing popular Google apps. The phones became a lot less attractive in markets outside of China as a result. Oliver Bowden the UK's digital and culture minister said, given the uncertainties this creates around the Huawei supply chain, the UK can no longer be confident it will be able to guarantee the security of future Huawei 5G equipment. The decision is a big win for the Trump administration, which has been pushing allies to exclude Huawei from their 5G networks, given that the Chinese company is a threat to national security. Ed Brewster a spokesperson for Huawei UK said, this is about U.S. trading policy, not security. The U.S. president claimed credit for the U.K. move, posting in a press conference that no White House has been tougher on China than his administration. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo declared, the tide is turning against Huawei as citizens around the world are waking up to the dangers of the Chinese Communist Party surveillance. Today, the Chinese government strongly condemned the UK's actions and foreign ministry spokeswoman Hua Chengying added, 
Beijing will take measures to safeguard the legitimate interests of the Chinese companies. Reporting for QTV News, I am Maria Amafar. We will go with another short commercial break. And when we return, we take a look at the sports news. Welcome back. And now sports. After months of work to improve the Bacau Mini Stadium in preparation for this year's Nawetan tournament, the sports committee has announced postponement of this year's community football tournament traditionally staged during the rainy season. Mumore Gajaga has more. According to the first vice president of the Bacau Sports Committee, Badi Jete, the move is initiated by the coronavirus restrictions imposed by the government. Even though most restrictions on public gatherings are eased, sports in general is not among them. Nawetan is the most popular football competition in the country and attracts huge numbers of spectators more than the domestic league. Most of the community football committees rely on ticket sales from Nawetan matches to improve their football fields. Others use the funds to finance their league clubs. Badi Jeta says the postponement will have serious effect on the operations of the committee and the teams. Jeta also says the coronavirus pandemic has affected all aspects of life, including sports, citing other countries in our region where sporting activities were also suspended. The Bacau Mini Stadium pitch looks fresh, but it will take some time before football is hosted on it. At least for Nawetan football fans, there will be a year-long wait. Momodu Gajaga, QTV News. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. Mr. Lamin Bojang has been expelled from the Gambe Action Party following a video said to be of a nude Mr. Bojang, which was widely shared on social media. The Public Service Pensions Bill 2020, tabled by the Vice President, was read for a second time by lawmakers at the National Assembly. An unidentified witness on Thursday told the TRRC about the horrible experience she and her child went through during the former president's so-called HIV treatment program. In international news, the International Criminal Court on Wednesday broke new ground when it opened the trial of a Malian jihadist charged with gross human rights violations against women and girls. And U.S. President Donald Trump has signed an order to put an end to preferential economic treatment for Hong Kong after China enacted a new security law. In sports, 
The Bacau Sports Committee has announced the postponement of this year's community football tournament, traditionally called Nawetan. That's all for you in this bulletin. Join us at 10 for another bulletin. Thank you for watching.